Good morning, everybody. Um, I think we're about to get started. So thank you all again for joining us today on um, Resolve's third annual Global Forum. We're really excited to have you here, and I am very excited to be able to introduce our next Salon session. So my name is Katira Arya Inejad, and I am a research associate and project manager for the Resolve Network. And over the past year, I've been helping to coordinate our newest research initiative in Lake Chad Basin. So in 2017, um, in partnership with USAID, Resolve embarked on its second research fellowship and exchange project to better understand the politics of religion in higher education in Chad, Cameroon, and Nigeria. This is a subject that's often talked about um, in CVE circles, but not very fully fleshed out, I guess, in the research. So in order to illuminate and bring up local insights to better inform policy and practice, um, we embarked on a country case study, a three country case study with our research teams here and our research advisor, Dr. Jacob Udo Udo Jacob. So pre to present the findings from their research, um, I would like to hand over the time to them and Dr. Jacob, who will be facilitating the discussion and also give them all my thanks um, for being wonderful partners in this effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. Kat and the entire Resolve team uh, have worked really, really hard on this research and the findings are really, really interesting. So um, thank you so much for coming out for the Salon discussion on the Lake Chad region. May I get the researchers, um, the fellows and the principal investigators to please introduce themselves starting with Dr. Dama. Good morning, everybody. Not sure we got that right, I think. I think you're on now. Good morning, everybody. It's up on. Okay, I, th I think it's, it's on now. Yes. All right. Thank you. I'm Adama Osman from Cameroon. I'm a lecturer at the History Department, and my research is based, mainly based on comparative religion and politics, mainly religious identities and ethnic identities, both in Cameroon, Chad, and Nigeria. My involvement in this research is mainly dealing with the regulation of religion in higher education, mainly how university students can be through higher education counter to violence extremism. This was the main research problematic we were dealing with, with Professor Brandon. Hi, I'm Dr. Brandon Kinhammer from Ohio University and I was the principal investigator for the Cameroon portion of the project. Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Medina Abdulaziz. I'm the research fellow for the Nigerian country study for this research. I'm from the Nigerian Defense Academy. Uh, good morning, uh, Abdullah Sunai. I am a, a principal investig investigator on the Nigerian uh, case, and I am senior research fellow at the Zentrum Modern Orient in Berlin. Good morning, I am Oyenati Remadi. I'm the research fellow for Chad, and I'm working for a Chadian small uh, social scientist lab called Centre de Recherche en Anthropologie et Sciences Humaines Crash, and I'm also lecturing at the Department of Anthropology at Tanjamena University. And I'm Daniel Isinga. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, University of Quebec in Montreal in the Centre Franco Pé. Um, and I was the principal investigator for Chad on this project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me stay with you, Dan and Ramaji. Can you tell us the core findings of your project in Chad? Yeah, yes, so thank you, I'm a start. Uh, I think that we uh, came out with uh, some three main findings. And since we 
have been working on secularism and the way secularism is implemented within the higher education sector, what we came out with first is that uh, there is a big ambiguity related to the way secularism as such is accepted uh, in the country in, in general, but also the way it's accepted within higher education and even the way it's implemented within the curricula and also the way faculties are organized. And second, we also came out uh, with uh, the fact that in the country, uh, when talking about secularism or when talking about language uh, for teaching or administration within universities, we have a big overlap of language issues and religions. This is to mean that most of the time, Arabic and French are dividing uh, universities, so dividing students and faculty members, but also uh, are provoking a kind of two different uh, curricula within the same system. And so uh, most of the time you have the departments or the students divided following religious languages when it comes to uh, francophone departments or uh, Arabic departments. Most of the, or totally all, the students from uh, Arabic departments being Muslims. The same thing for the teachers, etc. So uh, this is to, to conclude and to hand up to, to, to Dan. We come out with the fact that uh, the state uh, despite his secular agenda, is unable to implement on the field, you know, a secular teaching curricula. And the rejection of secularism as an idea is growing so within uh, Muslim communities uh, mainly. Yeah, perhaps I'll um, add just a little bit of context to say that uh, one of the main objectives of the study was to get a handle on the different debates over the role of religion in the public sphere. Uh, and institutes of higher education, whether they be public universities, private universities, teacher training colleges, or cultural centers across uh, the region are important places where those debates are taking place. Uh, and so what ended up coming out in our research uh, is exactly what Ramaji was explaining, is that you have different cleavages or groupings of people based on a variety of different socially constructed uh, identity factors uh, that kind of create a positionality in those debates. And the state uh, is both a, an actor in those debates, but also something that structures those debates. Um, and so that's really what we've tried to capture in our findings. Did your findings surprise you at all? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a little surprising because when you just consider the, the, the idea of uh, secularism being enshrined in the Constitution, so it's surprising to come on the field and see that actors that normally are, are controlled by the main state are able challenging, you know, uh, this secular agenda. And, but at the same time, it's not that surprising because if you see the structure of the state and the way the state is implementing uh, on the field uh, all its agendas, this is not that surprising. And at the same time, to finish, you can also see that this is not too much surprising because the state is playing a game with religious actors, giving them more room on some issues, refusing rooms on some issues. So those people, in, in turn, they also play the state, you know, to fulfill the agenda, so it's a little surprising, but not that much. Okay. Yeah, I think I would simply, uh, I agree entirely. There are some surprising elements and unsurprising aspects. Uh, it's not surprising to find out that there are debates over the role of religion in the public sphere. Um, it's not surprising necessarily that uh, there's an Arabic and French division in that debate, right? Um, but what was surprising is how actively engaged some religious leaders on university campuses, um, depending on their affiliations, are being, uh, are shifting their stances appropriately appropriately uh, to try and pressure the, straight in, the state in different directions. I'll, I'll come back to you a bit, a bit later on, because uh, you've raised some very important issues. I'll, I'll be right back to you. Um, now, Adama and um, Brandon, 
Can you tell us a bit more about the research in Cameroon and some of the core findings? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, the, the top line finding of relevance for, for policymakers and, and practitioners is that uh, there's very little evidence that, that VE organizations are active on Cameroonian campuses that they're recruiting. We don't see a lot of evidence for VE um, support among Muslim college students. Uh, but what we do find is that increasingly, uh, as the Cameroonian war on terror has progressed and as there's been sort of an increasing securitization of Muslim life, um, particularly on campus, uh, we, we do see that kind of simmering tensions and conflicts and resentments about Muslim access to higher education, about the inadequacies of the primary and secondary school institutions in Cameroon um, are starting to bleed into campus life. That increasingly, particularly for Muslim students who are on non-Muslim majority campuses um, in the southern part of the country, that there's sort of a perception of government wariness towards them, a perception that they are increasingly perceived as being potential VE actors, even where there's not a lot of evidence that that's the case, um, and that this is undermining uh, confidence in the sense of, of fairness and, and, and balance that's implied in Cameroonian secularism. So like Chad, Cameroon has this francophone uh, heritage of laicite that you know, nominally suggests the separation between religion and state, but that in practice is often, I think, under understood by a lot of Cameroonians as a promise that the state will be fair and balanced in the way that it manages religion. And there's an increasing sense among Muslim students that that's not how it's really playing out for their experience. They see campuses as places that are Christian spaces that are difficult for them to get equal treatment on. Um, we don't think that these are likely to manifest as VE dynamics, but they do produce really challenging political consequences um, that we think undermine potentially the ability of the Cameroonian state to sort of fully incorporate those um, those students into public life later on. Romaji? Sorry, um, Adama. Yeah, what Brandon was saying is that the real daily reality we are facing in our campuses as far as religious regulation by the states is concerned, there is a duality in the state discourse that they are against any financial or political support of any religion, be it Christianity or Islam. But when we look at on the knee, since the prayers then is from Christian origin, there is a kind of state support on the knee to Christianity on the campuses compared to Islam. And those are the sources of, uh, let's say, not conflict, but tension between Muslim student union and Christian student union. And this is really difficult for the state to solve the issue as far as the management of the universities are concerned. Because Christian students are receiving a kind of foreign support from Christian organization outside the country. Muslim students are receiving almost the same support from Muslim or Arabic countries, but the state is denying the Islamic support in order to promote the Christian support upon Muslim students. And this is a really difficult situation in Cameroon, actually. Did you notice this contributing in one way or the other to um, maybe extremist opinions on Cameroon? So, uh, one of the interesting things that you note on Cameroonian universities is that um, there's not nearly as much intra-Muslim conflict sort of visible on campuses as, say, in Nigeria, where I've also done research, and I know you guys are going to talk about that. And a lot of that really does come down to the role that the state plays in regulating um, not just religion, but civil society more generally. There's really only one Muslim Students Association that's sort of registered with the state and has the ability to kind of manage religious life on campus for Muslims. And that sort of need to work with the state, to be visible to the state, to be um, legible to state authorities, diminishes a lot of Sufi Salafi conflict. It diminishes a lot of intra Salafi conflict. It means that the Muslim students really sort of put on a brave face in front of the state. Um, how, how deep that reconciliation is, to what extent that's masking sort of deeper conflicts underneath, I think is difficult to get at under the political context. But and once again, we see very little evidence that what it's doing is leading to VE support. I think that there's a pretty, it, near as we could tell, and we looked pretty closely, um, near universal understanding that, that VE appeals are not um, particularly, campuses are not amenable places for VE appeals in Cameroon. Now whether that's because Muslim students
students are resistant who show up on campus or whether because campuses are resistant, that's harder to tell. That's a, in some ways a different project, but we really don't see a lot of evidence that VE organizations have a lot of obvious ways to make inroads. The Cameroonian government's fear that that's true compounds other problems. Was this surprising though? I mean, I, 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 I don't know that it's, I mean, I think it's surprising to the Cameroonian government. I don't think it's nearly um, as surprising to us. I mean, these dynamics sort of play out in different ways in the different countries that we've looked at. Um, but, I mean, the idea that, that extensive state management and control of religion has a, a range of impacts, some of which are good and some of which are really problematic, I think is not a surprise. And so it's been good for intra-Muslim conflict on campus. It's been bad for the situation of Muslim students who find themselves facing what they perceive to be increasing um, discrimination and lack of access. Interesting. Um, Nigeria presents a much more complex case study. Um, let me invite Martina and Abdullahi to tell us more about the Nigerian case study and the core findings. Um, yes, so the Nigerian case is somewhat complex because it's kind of similar to what the Chadian research finds, finds in some cases and also similar to the Cameroonian situation, but also different in all dynamics. And I'm going to start with the fact that just like in Cameroon, there is no direct um, um, evidence or link to show that violent extremist tendencies are present on campus, um, especially because there was a lot of attention when Boko Haram started with the understanding that it was some university students who had turned their university certificates to decide to join this group. And that kind of placed um, an assumed focus on um, the fact that there might be extremist threats on the university campuses, but the research that we carried out didn't show this direct link. However, from the research, we realized that student religious associations, especially the Muslim Student Association and the Federation of Catholic Students for the Christians, these two groups and the other subgroups that they have on campuses have um, a lot of um, power and um, controlling influence, and especially um, ability to control behavior on campus. And um, this um, ability to control behavior, ability to influence their members to um, carry out agendas of this association is kind of um, risky as it is. And then more importantly is that apart from the fact that they have power, religion is being used as a, a very vibrant resource on campus, just the way it is used as a vibrant resource in the Nigerian society. And it means that the competing factors that we have between um, intra-religious uh, religion itself, like the Salafi Sufi competition, the um, Sufi Shia competition that we have in the Nigerian society is also being extrapolated through these associations on campus. And so this um, competition for followership, competition for spheres of influence are also being played out on the campus. And these are some of the risks that um, are beginning to play out. They're not directly extremists, but they also um, as risk that should be, um, the attention should be paid um, when I read your executive summary and the full report itself, what, what surprised me really was that you did not find any evidence of linkages between religion on campus and violent extremism. Abdullahi, did that surprise you? Uh, not really. I've been working on, uh, on similar issues, but in a different context in Niger. But I also started some research in Nigeria and then looking at the... Uh, uh, Zaria context, the kind of configuration of religious uh, organizations, religious uh, figures, uh, for example, the Shia, the, the Salafi. So I uh, already knew the significance of, of religion and religiosity as, uh, uh, for example, in the case of the student uh, organizations, uh, these organizations are really uh, socialization spaces, and they really play a significant role, but you can it beyond the, the campus. So in a way, uh, that wasn't surprising to me, but one element that was a bit surprising to me in this research was the role of the faculty members. So we are talking about student uh, religious uh, associations, but actually one thing that maybe get uh, lost in, in this kind of uh, terming or naming of these
this organization is the, the faculty uh, members. Because these organizations, they are very much related to, to, to the staff. I mean, to the, to the staff, but also to the faculty members. So they have this uh, uh, patron system, they, they, they call it in the context of uh, uh, ABU, uh, Ahmadou Bello University. So, and often the uh, one of the um, category or the main, one of the main uh, uh, patron uh, is really the, the category of the faculty member, who is, which is basically uh, those who are supporting these organizations in terms of, uh, yeah, financial resources, but also in terms of uh, getting organized, uh, creating opportunities for activities, uh, but also networking with other uh, religious organizations beyond the uh, campus itself. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. Most um, secularization theorists would say that the advancement of modernity would somehow result in the diminishing of religion and superstitious beliefs in that sense. And Nigeria, over the past few years, Nigeria has really advanced economically, technologically in so many different ways. And something you said which I found quite interesting, um, religion occupying social space. Can you talk more about that? within religion occupying a, a space that's beyond transcendental ideological meaning, but maybe providing a space for identity, for group identity, or fulfilling um, yeah. maybe social meaning. Yeah, I think what, what really, uh, what was clear and, and really uh, what came up, uh, up clearly in our research is really that, that kind of, yeah, there is that transcendental, transcendental dimension of, of religion and religiosity. But really what you see uh, with these organizations is the, the social dimension the kind of the way religion offers uh, opportunity to, uh, to to come together uh, to uh, opportunities for grouping for uh, being forming a social for a social group uh, 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 in a context where uh, I have to say uh, grouping is really important so you have to to, to find uh, which group you you belong uh, which uh, organization you, you belong to so that is really uh, something that religion uh, helps uh, to do in uh, on the specific context we uh, we conducted this uh, this research Medina, yeah and I, I think I would also want to um, take it from what Abdullah said is the fact that in Nigeria as it is it is um, a very, a very not religious in the sense that everybody does some practical, um, consistent worship. But in the fact that religion is now such an identity tool that um, groups can mobilize, as it is, right. in order to achieve specific aims. And um, in the context of this research that was done on campuses, these religious associations have mastered the art of mobilizing religion, right. transcending religion religious roles and um, carrying out activities that go beyond their expected roles as religious associations. And these activities basically place them in the heart and um, purview of the students so much that they become so influential in um, galvanizing either support or galvanizing views to support their agendas. So I think also apart from the fact that religion is an identity at all. More importantly is the ability for these associations to mobilize religion right. for their um, goals. Now, um, uh, that's quite fascinating. Um, although you did not find any evidence of um, connections b between religion and extremism on, on campuses there in Nigeria, um, what happens when religion is mobilized, as, as, as you said? What, what happens when um, a strong leader emerges? What happens if um, there are uh, um, grievances, strains, political opportunities emerge. Um, did you consider that? Um, so in the research, there are two distinct examples that show what happens when first religion is mobilized for goals, and this happened in the Maltech issue. Maltech is the Modibo Adama University. It's located um, in the northeast of Nigeria. And here, it was a simple case of a campus election, which was supposed to lead to the emergence of a student union Union president, but um, a Christian student had emerged as the winner, and the 
Muslim group refused to accept this, leading to violence on campus, leading to the death of one student, and the closure of the university. So eventually, when grievances are kind of trampled upon, like you said, when um, religion is, um, the grievances are aggravated, the first result is that it, it would lead to violence on campus, which is um, one of the risks that needs to be mitigated. The second is with the emergence of um, leaders, as you said. Most of these associations, especially in Ahmad Bello University, they pride themselves as being um, springboards where most of the leaders of the country, um, it's like a practice board. If you are a student leader in these associations, then it seems like it's much more possible that you will become um, a political figure in Nigeria. And it is true because um, they have a lot of alumni. Most of their patrons are also former members of the associations when they were in the universities, and that's why they still have this link. But this um, ability to prepare students as leaders played through in the emergence of um, Ibrahim El Zaki who is the head of the Shia group in Nigeria now. He was an ABU student. Um, he was studying economics, and that this was it was a time when he was a student that he started to promulgate Shia ideas. And because the university was um, averse to any kind of um, ideology, which they do not on the, which they do not um, see as nominal uh, as it is right now, but um, he, he emerged and then he was expelled. But this did not stop him from starting the Shia organization right now with a strong, strong presence in Zaria. But contemporarily, the Shia is um, becoming targeted for different reasons. Some organizations think they are extremists, using that in like um, quoted uh, um, inferences. But like it's possible, like you said, for a leadership um, to, for organizations that are not nominal to emerge in this kind of um, spaces, and it is also possible possible for um, leaders to emerge in this kind of um, um, contested spaces. Interesting. All right. Ab Ab Abdullahi, then Hi. Brandon. Okay. okay. Uh, well, so just, if we think about this as a CVE issue, one of the things that comes up in all of our research is that in all of these countries, the state plays a fairly big role in trying to manage what religion is like on campus. Mm -hmm. The state recognizes these organizations. In some cases, it provides them with funding. It makes it difficult for other organizations to emerge. It really is this desire to sort of centrally manage to a certain extent the role of religious expression on campus. And what emerges is a clear pattern across all of these cases is that this is not a successful operation. We still see religious violence in Nigeria on campus. In fact, religious violence is somewhat more common on campus than it is off campus. Um, we see conflicts in Chad, we see resentments in Cameroon. Um, and it's, it's, it's really not at all clear that there are the institutional mechanisms on campus beyond the sort of simple fact of attempting to control what organizations exist and who their leadership are um, that really allow religious communities to solve these problems practically. And so we think about what sort of CVE programming would work. Um, I mean, there is this sort of tendency to think about it in terms of, oh, well, we need peace building or we need um, you know, messages of tolerance. And really, what comes across across in all of these instances is that there are not places for these organizations to sit down and work out access to campus, to work out where we're gonna, um, how we're gonna do this balancing, right? These things come out spontaneously because the states all sort of assume that these things are taken care of by, you know, making sure that these organizations are formally represented rather than it being a sort of a space where these things can be worked out in practice. Um, there are not a lot of places at camp on campuses in the Lake Chad Basin where you can work out religious conflicts privately or before they pop up onto campus life. Abdullah. Yeah, what, what I wanted to add to what uh, Medina said is, yeah, uh, of course, there is no direct uh, link between, uh, I mean, in our findings, we didn't really see any uh, direct link between uh, these religious activities uh, or religious association and violent extremism. Uh, but there is something also which is uh, uh, which needs to be kept in mind is really uh, religion has become uh, a source of conflict and it could it's it's really a, a site or a reason for a lot of competition on on campus or, or friction confrontations even so you think about uh, for example the, the the opposition between the Salafi and the, and the Sufi the Tijania in particular over let's say the control of the mosque uh, or uh, 
competition or rivalry uh, about okay the resources because students are supposed to pay uh, basically uh, religious fees or fees uh, they, that, that later on go uh, into uh, the hands of the, the religious uh, association. So in the case, for example, of the Muslim uh, uh, students, so the fees, those resources go into the hands of the MSS, the Muslim Student uh, Society. But the, t the, the Timsan, which is the Tijaniya uh, organization, doesn't get any of those, of those fees. So they, are, they have grievances. So they are asking themselves, okay, what is MSS doing with those, uh, those uh, resources? So those are the kind of uh, situations where, uh, though there are no direct relationship between these uh, kind of activities and violent extremists, we found that uh, those could be enough reasons for uh, radicalization on, on, on university campuses, in particular at Hamadou Bello University. Yeah, and I think, sorry Jacob, and I think to kind of put together the point that Brandon and Abdullahi were making is the state would um, find a way to influence Japanese on campus, well most times they do it through the university authorities themselves, and the positions that are taken by university authorities sometimes, and in the case of ABU, also influence the competition and the grievances. So for example, in ABU, the university has chosen to recognize only the MSS as the single um, Muslim association on the MSS campus. MSS is a Muslim student, student society. society. Yes, as the single um, Muslim um, student association on campus, when there are in ABU alone seven other Muslim religious associations that are not recognized, and Timsan, which is the Tijaniya Muslim Student Association, is one of them. There is the association for the Shia Muslim students too. So the de decision to recognize only one association, which is um, accused of being Salafi, as it is, um, is to the detriment of the other associations who are now having to compete with MSS for the control of the mosque, for the use of the mosque, for the control control of finances, which goes directly to the MSS, and the, this, um, the position that the university authorities have taken to recognize just one association is um, detrimental as it is, especially when you compare the position of um, ABU authority to school authorities, University of Ibadan, who recognize 37 different student religious associations, giving room for everybody to be expressive with their views, giving room for everybody to have access to business communities as religious associations. So just like the state, I would say also the role played by um, school authorities, university authorities also needs to be focused on. So is the idea then of creating sort of a multi-dimensional space for various religious identities to be and to exist. Um, let me come back to you, Ramaji and, and, and Dan. Um, what then do you think in the case of Chad, what are the, the possible stimulations, what are the possible strains, um, maybe at the macro level or the meso level, um, that can lead to extremism? What are those triggers that can lead to violent extremism? What did you observe? Well, uh, I think one of the big things that we walked away from, and I guess maybe I should preface this by saying something that's surprising is maybe not surprising now, is that uh, we didn't find this linkage between university campuses and violent extremist groups. Um, but something that is there is the potential for further cleavage and grievance to develop across the lines of language in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with the fact that uh, certain resources are given Across, based on universities that are, uh, there's a university that's primarily Arabic speaking, right? Uh, and so resources are directed toward that university differently than they would be in another public setting university, which is primarily Francophone. Uh, then in other public universities, you may have a department of say history or some other discipline, uh, and you'll have faculty members below that teach in French and faculty members that teach in Arabic, but the administration at the university level uh, has one person in charge and they'll either belong to one group or the other. And then of 
course, opportunities for teaching, opportunities for resources, opportunities for research, uh, they end up being uh, perhaps unfairly distributed. Um, and that leads, of course, to dynamics of cleavage and grievance within those groups. Um, and it doesn't help to establish aspects of collaboration or negotiation over those grievances like we've talked about in some of these other cases. I don't know if you want to add something, Ramaji. Yeah, I want to, to add some little thing. Uh, it's about the, the way the, the state is controlling the, the, the universities. And one of the reasons who uh, made uh, the fact that we didn't find very uh, close link between uh, VE and the campuses is also uh, the way the campuses are, are managed by the state. You know, in Chad, as they have been explaining in Nigeria, uh, in Chad there are no possibility. We have what the state called the official trend of Islam in the country, uh, being the, here the Tijania. Mm. And so uh, there's no place for the other trends to enter the public sphere officially. And so on the campuses, uh, there is no possibility for teachers when they claim being uh, not Tijani or even for the students, there is no room for them. And so on the campus, uh, it's very difficult to make a clear link between uh, VE and uh, the campuses because people want to play, I mean, a role that allows them being part of the system. But what we should be, uh, uh, what we should care about is also what is going on uh, besides the universities. Because if those people, they don't have voice in the official life of the campuses, at the same time, they can uh, study abroad in uh, other universities and get back in the countries. They have a lot of associations. Although they don't have official uh, part in the debate, they are growing. And this may be something that may end up you know, in more radicalization because they are not given part to the official debate. And so we have associations, uh, one of the associations called Ansarasuna, who is a quite uh, solid association uh, who receive a lot of uh, funding from other countries that are doing a lot of activities. But this association is not allowed to enter the public sphere, being the universities, being the media. But at the same time, you know, their influence is growing in the country. So I'm sure that even though students actually don't play uh, their appartenance to such, uh, such associations, I'm sure that behind the university, they are getting more and more close to those kind of associations. So this is something that we should also care about. Interesting. So for, for the policy makers in the room, the practitioners in the room, or even academic researchers in the room, what recommendations do you, do you have, Brandon and Adama? That's right. If one is interested in undertaking um, any programming or intervention or even research in Cameroon. Yeah, as far as the Cameroonian case is concerned, I think the state must be fair to religious leaders or to religious associations. When it comes to Islam, we have Northern Cameroon, which is portrayed as being Muslim part of the country. And we have twice curricula, one from Islamic studies and the other one from standard official, uh, uh, let's, let's say Western studies. And those two types, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> those two types of educations are really posing a kind of conflictual issue in higher education. Students can register from primary, secondary schools until uh, GCEA level in Islamic studies. When they are to enter university, they cannot find the same curricula. They have to shift into Western education. And this is really conflictual for more than 30,000 students. Why? Because they cannot face the same language of education, which is French or English, while they are coming from Arabic-speaking background. This is first problem. The second problem is that the type of Islamic education they received so far was authorized by state, but this type of education cannot lead to professional integration in the national sphere. 
So they end up without any job at the end of their training, without any future in this type of system, in this type of government, and they still look at the other side, how the government is implementing a policy to help Christian students, Christian associations. So the claim is now, if the state failed to be equal to both the religious sides, let Muslim students also have their own university, a Muslim Muslim university in Northern Cameroon. The state is not against of it. This, the government is saying, we are ready to provide you an authorization to open your Islamic studies, to your Islamic studies, your Islamic university, please. Right. But the initiative must come from the community. Don't expect, expect any financial support, any political support from the government, because we are dealing with a laicity, a kind of secularism yeah. in, in, in Cameroon. So the Muslim society and Muslim students still are waiting the government to give them a floor to have a kind of same equal visibility at the local level and at the national level without being fair to those communities, I think the government will be complicating the situation of religious identity of, or religion understanding in Northern Cameroon compared to the rest of the Cameroon. Interesting. What, what spaces are there, Brandon, for, for possible programming or intervention? So, I mean, again, one of the sort of persistent things that we see is that even for st former students, current students, who, you know, lack access, who struggle with employment afterwards, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence that VE is an attractive alternative for them. This is the good news. It means maybe that there's not a ton of need for what you would think of as traditional CVE programming on campus. However, with the securitization of Muslim experiences in campus, Maroon, with the ongoing war on terror, there is a persistent underutilization of the resources that exist on campus that could be potentially useful in a broader CVE terrain in Cameroon, right? Um, so we think about KAMSU, the Muslim Student Union, the one Muslim organization that's officially recognized on campus. Um, when we talked to their leaders, they were very eager to be involved in, in CVE style work, not just because they see VE as a problem in Cameroon, but because they also recognize that doing so would help to sort of inoculate their position with the state. They, they could say, we're, we're, we're involved in, in CVE work, see, we represent present the, the sort of mainstream position of students on campus, there's not a VE problem on campus, perhaps this would lead to more resources or better treatment of Muslim students. Um, but it's been hard for them to break into that, right? There's a real need, I think, for international partners to engage with Muslim students on campus, not as a problem or a potential risk, but as a resource. Um, Moreover, and I, I think that this is another issue um, that comes up in our own research too, is that there are a lot of sort of broad resources on campus, people who want to get involved, um, researchers, faculty, um, university administrators who recognize that there's a VE problem in Cameroon would like to get involved. Um, but they're not really able to participate as full partners because they're not able to access the CVE research. Um, they often lack the sort of methodological training to do the kinds of projects that we've been able to do. And they're often engaged with, again, as potential VE participants rather than resources. And so they need to be able to bring them in to offer training, um, not just to sort of run another set of workshops where we can take photo ops, um, but to really sort of engage in finding ways that they can be participating in building CVE knowledge to bring them in as equal partners in this work um, would take advantage of what they're able to offer in a way that really has not been leveraged so far. We didn't find a lot of evidence that there had been more than a kind of shallow engagement with those Muslim intellectuals, with those Muslim university faculty and researchers, and that's something that we see as a real potential next step. Thank you. Madina and Abdullahi, what do you reckon are the greatest opportunities or spaces that are available for programming or for the research? Yeah. Um, I think for me the um, major place where focus on programming, especially policy programming needs to be focused on is identifying who exactly are the major influencers that can actually um, um, affect behavior. And for me, especially with this Richard, it has to be the associations. But more importantly is that we, it's kind of good to play safe right now because we say there are no direct links between what is happening on campus and violent extremism. But most of the students don't even would not recognize 
violent extremist leanings if it comes to them right now. And I think that there needs to be some kind of preparation for them to understand these extremist leanings, to understand how programming for violent extremism can be expunged to students, to understand and be prepared for this kind of um, programs, for this kind of leanings to them when it comes. It's more like knowing, being prepared. They do not have that. And I think this is one of the areas where policy research or policy programming can be done. But secondly, also is to look at funding that is coming to these associations from their patrons, um, which sometimes are not just the faculty um, lecturers or faculty members that Abdullah mentioned, but sometimes the patrons of these associations are politicians. Some of them are wealthy individuals outside of the university campus. And it means that the ability for them to fund these organizations also would um, guarantee that they would get support from these organizations for whatever agenda they would have. So I think policy um, research or policy programming also should look at where funding is coming to these associations and guard against the ability to use this funding to either funnel any kind of negative control or funnel um, avenues through which extremist ideologies can be um, got into the universities through this. Abdullahi, let me be more specific with, with you. What would you caution against in terms of a future policy formulation? What are those, what would you really caution against? Look, this is, don't bother about this area. Yeah, but I think it's very important not to exceptionalize these organizations. I think really uh, looking at these uh, uh, organizations, they they are, I mean, you, you, you when when we uh, we look at their dynamics, their competition, the kind of rivalries going on, I think it's, it's really important not to put them out there as really exceptional uh, like uh, uh, organizations. So uh, that would be my, my really strongest <laughs> recommendations while dealing with these uh, organizations. And that, I think, it should be uh, a major element uh, to keep in mind for policymakers. Uh, so for example, uh, how they, 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 they feel about, okay, the kind of uh, unfair treatment they are, uh, some are getting from the administration or from uh, uh, the government or from the state. Those would be elements that should be uh, taken on board. Done, for Chad. Um, well, in terms of recommendations, I think that the, the biggest recommendation I would make is that I think that inter-university and inter-department programs aimed at collaboration uh, would be essential. Uh, if we can start to bridge these divisions that have started to emerge around language and religion across different institutions, um, I think that that could be really beneficial. And there's a real desire amongst my Chadian colleagues uh, to, to do research and to engage in projects and to have those kinds of opportunities and resources. Um, and so anything that can facilitate that uh, was, is, from a policy point of view, I think a, a positive thing. Um, that could be something as simple as identifying different research centers that um, you know, represent different linguistic groups and having them collaborate on a project together. Um, what I think that should be something that should be avoided, I don't think there's any need for counter messaging or programming in the university institutions of Chad, uh, at least not at this stage. Um, and I don't know that throwing week-long seminars to bring people together around living together peacefully uh, is something that's making a huge difference at this stage. Uh, I think that really just brings together the people that are already living together peacefully. Um, I guess I can end on that somewhat controversial statement. Ramaji? Interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah, I will say almost the same thing because the core issue we uh, pointed out in our research is the overlapping of uh, language and uh, religion. And to me, the most important thing to do is trying to uh, work in order to stop languages dividing people following religious lines. And so the main thing to do is for me a kind of uh, designing a universal uh, curricula. Uh, whatever the language is Arabic or French, the curricula have to be the same and giving equal opportunity to all Chadians, whatever the language is. This is one. And also is working, uh, you know, to, to, to make those uh, religious curricula that are very tough actually in uh, Arabic teaching universities, to make them less obligatory than they are actually. This also may be a way, you know, to give equal chance to everybody, whatever the teaching language is. And the real thing to, to avoid 
is you know the about the, the role of the state as i said and people that may read our brief uh, will see that the, the state is playing using identity markers mainly religion and other things uh, the state is like playing a chess game with all those markers and it's about stop playing that game because people on the field they also have agency and so ignoring their agency and their ability to play also a game against the state this is also something very dangerous fantastic um, let me just ask you one question Adama um, the, the the crisis in the English speaking part of Cameroon did that affect your your research at all or even the methodology you choose to to adopt for the project did it come out at all yes as far as identity manipulation are concerned, I think we are facing the same problem. No matter how English-speaking Cameroon would like to portray the uprising that's going on actually as a kind of a separation from the former French type of, of, of state, going from republic type of state to federalism. Still, the government is still manipulating the regional identity, and that's what they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear that we are Cameroon, English-speaking Cameroon, and we are French-speaking Cameroon. And within two types of positions, there is violence, actually, as a matter of discussions. There is no other negotiations than violence. And when it comes to Northern Cameroon, it's not the same issue. There are some issues of misunderstanding between local population, local community, and the state, but there's no use of violence to explain, to exp explain their misunderstanding. So the two issues can be put together as far as resolution of conflict are concerned in, in Cameroonian actual situation. If I can add one thing to that, I, so one of the, and I, I've told this story a number of times now since I've been back from Cameroon, one of the things that we would hear occasionally is Adam and I would go out to do interviews with, with Muslim student leaders, with Muslim organizational leaders was, oh, you're here to talk about extremism. We should be talking about those extremists in the Anglophone part of the country. And, you know, it's easy to sort of write that off as a deflection or, you know, ethnic linguistic chauvinism, but I think it speaks to the degree to which a lot of Muslim communities, particularly elite intellectual Muslim communities in Cameroon feel very much like they are targeted as extremists, right? That they are understood to be a potential problem or risk. And there is this very clear desire to deflect that or to show that they're not the problem or the only problem. Now, obviously this has the implications that Adama has suggested. It makes it hard to bring Anglophones and Francophones together in Cameroon. But it also, like, they didn't come to that understanding by accident or in a vacuum. It is very much the case that these communities have been treated as potential extremists, and that's, that's, that's been a big part of the programming that's been run, not just in Cameroon, but that's been sort of implicit in a lot of international partner activities. And I think our research really speaks to the need to find ways to engage Muslim communities in Cameroon that don't implicitly suggest that they're the potential problem. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Please, a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for the research team. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I just want to say that the, um, the, the research report will be available sometime soon, but currently the, um, the executive summaries and the core findings are currently available. Thank you. Thank you. One more round of applause for everyone.